Welcome to Nepal Now, I'm Marty Logan. Building Back Better, The Green Recovery, Sustainable Transformation. It seems I've been reading those phrases time and again during the past pandemic year. And sometimes I wonder if they're just attempts to find a bright spot amid the devastation of COVID-19. Or are they a sincere recognition that something fundamental must change if we humans want to continue living life on this planet as we've known it till now? I must admit that I'm scared for the future that my daughter and her friends will face, mainly because of almost daily images of climate catastrophes. Melting glaciers, deadly cold snaps in places like Texas, and bleak brown Himalayan peaks that I can see from my home on a clear day. But in positive moments, I am heartened by reports of gigantic solar and wind farms replacing fossil fuel sources and the accelerating uptake of electric vehicles. That's why I was happy to see a recent study about the positive and negative consequences of COVID-19 on Nepal's quest to reach the global sustainable development goals by 2030. Today's guest, Sijal Pokhrel, is one of nearly four dozen experts who did that work. Recalling our chat, I think her clarity and optimism encourage me maybe as much as the study results themselves. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to like, follow, or favorite Nepal Now. We're on most of the major podcast players, including Spotify, which just became available here in Nepal. Stay updated with the show on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, and you can write to me at marty at martylogan.net. And now, here's my chat with Sijal Pokhrel. Sijal Pokhrel, welcome to Nepal Now Podcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Marty. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. So you were one of uh, many researchers who participated in a study that has been submitted for publication. The paper has been submitted for publication recently. And it looks at how the effects of COVID-19 could um, affect Nepal's efforts to reach the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. And I'm wondering if you could briefly tell us about your role in that research and overall, very briefly, summarize the results of that uh, study. Yeah, of course. So uh, when we look back to the mechanism of uh, sustainable development goal itself, uh, it was designed to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. And even the uh, SDG summit in 2019, it called this decade as a decade of action in which it had pleaded its signatories country to mobilize the resources to uh, enhance national implementation to achieve SDGs within the stipulated time of 2030. But with the outbreak of COVID-19, the overall trajectory of these goals were uh, disproportionately halted in one or the other way. And when we narrow down and look at Nepal, itself. Nepal is a developing country. We did remarkably well if we look back to the Millennium Development Goal. And it's obvious that the expectation for the Sustainable Development Goals achievement is also there. That's why it was a mere need for Nepal to be soon seen through the lens of SDGs and understand where we stood in the midst of pandemic. So 44, in fact, 45 uh, national and uh, international researchers and scholars from all around the world, we came together to actually understand the dynamics of STZs and COVID-19 in Nepal. The idea is each goal will be led by one of us. So I led sustainable development goal number five, gender equality, uh, in which we were a small team of five members where I would coordinate and communicate with other team members and also coordinate and communicate with the identified experts for the respective SDGs. Okay, that sounds, that sounds great. So you were leading a team of five looking into... Uh, the gender equality goal of the SDGs. A lot of the news has been negative, um, and I'm thinking particularly of yeah. the impact of the pandemic on women's work, where there's a lot of talk about how women are having to leave the workforce and going back to the home. 
the other topic that has got a lot of media highlight is domestic violence, violence, familial violence also. Were those issues that you dealt with in your research? I remember we had uh, 22 experts working on in the field of SDG 5, uh, gender equality, and almost all of them uh, reported that the domestic violence has increased uh, almost by um, 50% and even more. The women living in the urban area now were uh, locked down inside the same house. So uh, they were facing the double jeopardy, that is, their work burden is there, their um, office work is there, and they also had to fulfill the role of caregiver, and they have to be intact in the kitchen. So um, there's this saying that women, they used to work from nine to five, but now they have to work from five to nine. They are now full-time mom, full-time caregiver, and full-time office worker. Um, that is one thing. There is also another thing that um, the judicial opening is now limited, and most of those judicial opening would only take uh, the report of um, the ca- COVID cases. And because of this, there the facilities of um, uh, the judicial opening would discourage the cases like domestic violence. So. That's also one of the significant cases where domestic violence has exacerbated in during the lockdown. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm. I'm not at all surprised that your experts confirm that after we had heard so so much about it earlier in the pandemic. I'm thinking of one possible positive impact, albeit it would be it would be limited, and that's I think what is the growth of women online. And I suspect that is a fairly narrow group of women. But as someone who myself spends a fair bit of time online, it seemed to me that there were more women being more active online. Did you find anything about that in your research? Yeah, actually we did, because even me, myself, being a woman and our experts, most of them were women. So they were kind of reluctant, kind of not so easy to go with technology um, when COVID uh, first hit. So uh, that was a kind of havoc where they had to, you know, like change their way of working in, in, in more digitized manner. But then later they themselves felt that they were more competent and they could actually uh, handle the tits and bits of digital things. Uh, Beside that, um, I think uh, our expert also reported that there are so many digital innovation that has provided women uh, an opportunity of entrepreneurship, which would uh, actually strengthen their skill and expand their business during pandemic. So, so many women, they have started their own online venture via which they could deliver their stuffs, like uh, um, some of them were making homemade uh, pickles some of them were making uh, homemade handicraft and some of them were also you know like preparing the small um, green business such as um, organic food uh, packaging some of them were more involved in nursery and which uh, since the, the the time was completely locked and all but then they their business was still there um, via the digital platform so some of the women I would say did um, utilize this new high of digital platform but of course there are lots of women who are living in the far-flung area where digitization has merely reached and I think that's why it has created another divide which we call digital divide where women uh, were differently exposed to the ICT and that's what has actually put impact upon, uh, upon the equality among the women themselves. The point you made about that, that divide, that digital divide, I think is really important because those of us who do spend a lot of time online, I think it's easy to think that most people are doing what we're doing. And in fact, it's good to remind ourselves that we are a minority who can spend that much time online. We have easy access usually, and we have the time to spend online. Before we get too far into these details, I wanted to step back a bit and again look at the the report more broadly and if i'm not mistaken overall the report found that the pandemic had had primarily 
or I should say had had negative effects on most of the goals. Uh, and it concluded that those negative effects could subside in the medium and long terms, and that they, the impacts, the ne negative impacts included the lockdowns, uh, unemployment, and less focus on issues that were not related to the pandemic. So other important development issues that just didn't get the same sort of focus because the pandemic was taking so much space. Is that a good summary of the overall findings of the report? Our report uh, also highlights um, the negative impact of pandemic because you know like sustainable development goal had to be realized within this decade and we are short of time it's just 10 years and we have to already implement uh, the actions but then a uh, developing country like Nepal would not actually realize or um, or you know like uh, have its trajectories in a full fledged because it has its own internal problems and conflict and the political instability and things so in the midst of this uh, the COVID-19 happened and of course uh, our report also highlights that most of the impacts were negative but yes our report in in its unique way has also highlighted the brighter side and that's what the beauty of our report is i would say well that's great because i am interested primarily i guess in those in those opportunities right I, we have heard a lot about the negative impact since the pandemic hit there has been a lot of talk about post pandemic what will happen right in these phrases like building back better and the green recovery and all of these phrases that you're hearing in different parts of the world that signify that we need to remake our our economies and our our societies in a much more sustainable way once we can kind of shift our attention away from the pandemic can you briefly outline what those bright spots are in terms of nepal what what the positive opportunities are? Yeah, as I already said, the brighter side of the pandemic is it has to be tapped on time. And, and of course, we also should be um, thoughtful that maybe the impact of those opportunities is not visible immediately, but it might be visible only in the midterm and long term while we think about, you know, realizing the sustainable development goal by 2030. So if we talk about the situation pre-COVID, then the world was in a phase where the development had no limitation and no reference. But um, uh, during the COVID or post-COVID, globally, we got an opportunity where we, where we could weigh the strength and weakness of our governance system, our socioeconomic system and our leadership system. And we could actually now identify the requirement of improvement in the planning and action of SDG itself to prepare ourselves um, for the further crisis, which was not so evident before pandemic. So in our study, we uh, present five key transformative opportunity. Uh, first, we have highlighted about the bigger lesson that we learned during the pandemic, because um, that's what we did we were we had nothing but but the lesson to learn uh, second is we have also proposed the safe landing which we have said socioeconomic recovery plan where we have highly talked about what government should be doing We've also talked about the brain gain because brain gain is a terminology not so famous and not so, you know, like popular when we used to review the um, literatures in terms of Nepal and reverse migration. And we've also talked highly about the ICT and digital economy that we touched upon in our previous conversation. And we've also highlighted um, how the local authority are now exercising their power after or during the pandemic. So these are the five uh, spots, I would say, that we have uh, highlighted in our report. Right. Thank you. I guess I'm a bit impatient uh, by nature. And so what, I, what I've been thinking about a lot around this report and conversation is how do we actually make these things happen on the ground, right? Uh, it's one thing to write down what needs to be done. But it's another to actually see it happen in a in a measurable way, 
And, and one of these points or, or one of these opportunities, which in a way is, a, I think, a combination of two opportunities, it is this idea of reverse brain gain and local governments. So it seems to me that some local governments, not all, but some, have been active in trying to capture that, that brain gain, the fact that people are coming home they may be in a situation where they don't necessarily want to leave the country again, and they're looking for ways that they can invest either money or time or both into developing a career and a life at home in their home country. And so some local governments I've read are initiating programs to do just that, to provide loans, etc. But I guess my question would be how to make sure that doesn't only happen in one or two or three local governments, but that it's something that's planned and approached in an organized kind of fashion. Do you see any, any evidence that we're now doing that? Or at least are you hopeful that the opportunity is there for real measurable uh, gains? So uh, if we look back to our past experiences of um, the episode of uh, different crises, be it a blockade or earthquake, um, or also maybe the pandemic, we have learned that um, we were so much dependent in terms of economy to the other countries, but we kind of surpassed or, you know, like sidelines our strength in terms of agriculture. Right. So uh, once there was a lockdown, once there was a blockade, once there was earthquake, we were in havoc because we had no resources and our strength in uh, in terms of agricultural product. We were not doing that and our lands were fallow. But um, owing to the virtue of the reverse migration, even the Ministry of Agriculture and Land Development reported that a large area of the field has been cultivated maize this time as compared to the last Last year. So it's visible that lots of people are coming back, the skilled workforce are coming back. And if um, given opportunity, those workforce can be actually capitalized to strengthen our already existing strength, that is agriculture. Going back to your question, um, is there something already happening which would actually, you know, like make an impact which we can measure in coming future? I think that um, major ma measuring tool would be a policy itself. So for the sustainable, sustainable transformation owing to the brain gain and agriculture, I think we need to have the policies which would utilize the reverse migration and brain gain and, you know, like we should uh, focus on creating green jobs. So I think swift and uh, widespread policies and action is needed to tap on the resources provided by this uh, reverse migration and uh, brain gain. Right. And your the report also makes this point quite strongly about the the small window of time that's shrinking, right? As you as you point out. And it's I think it's particularly apt in the case of brain gain, because people who have come back from a labor migration role can only stay here so long without making money. And then if nothing happens in Nepal, then you know, where else do they turn to, but again, leaving the country to go get work somewhere else. This idea of policy also, it makes sense, right? You need so, uh, something that kind of coordinates activities, but in order to create the policies, you need governments that are doing the analysis, first of all, and reading papers like this, and then acting on the evidence. At the moment, we have, at least with the, with the central government, we have a government, and you mentioned this earlier, that's very much in political turmoil. Does this present a, another challenge maybe for accelerating the transformation and, and getting it done before that window of opportunity closes? 
Yeah, I am afraid it could because, you know, like the opportunity won't wait for longer. And this opportunity is also a resultant of a very harsh pandemic. So, of course, we won't ex expect this opportunity to last longer, right? We, we already want to bounce back to the normal or at least to the newer. So with government focusing on the, its own stability, I think um, there might be a challenge to tap the opportunity on time. If we look at the economical growth rate also, uh, it has been estimated by the um, Asian Development Goal that the rate of economic growth um, would decrease to around 2% from 7%. So the system is fragile everywhere, not just political, but also in terms of economical. And if we look back to what Nepal's developmental vision is, Nepal actually want to graduate from underdeveloped country to developing country by 2022. But Nepal's socioeconomic uh, uh, portfolio is not good. We do not have proper socioeconomic platform that it would ensure the sustainable growth and development for everybody. So all the dimensions of the development for Nepali people does not look good. Right. So a lot of a lot of work to be done. I'm curious, were there government researchers included in the overall team? Yeah, actually, we we had we had academicians who, who were uh, from the Trevavan University themselves, and also in our research, we had um, at least twenty uh, online workshop where we had invited people from the local level government, also from the central and regional level. We had people from National Planning Commission themselves, so, and I'm sure that they are observing our report quite closely. And then we are hopeful that our reach research and our finding would help or add on to the government to prepare the uh, forthcoming plans. Right, okay. I want to go back to your own uh, area of focus, which, as you said, is SDG 5 um, and, and gender issues. So if you look at that area and the opportunities that were identified or came about because of the pandemic, and what are you hopeful about? Do you have some, some particular issues in mind where you think things can advance? If we go back to the period of COVID, we talked highly about the role of proper nutrients uh, if the proper nutrition is ensured, I think it will also um, ensure about ending malnourishment, thereby promoting the infrastructural and agricultural research. And it will also enhance the food, food uh, self-sufficiency that will overall add into uh, sustainable development to goal two. There will be more women um, who would um, have good health in terms of um, the proper nutrition and they would uh, face their pregnancy or their reproductive health with the good strength. There are a few like direct uh, brighter sports, for instance, like uh, if we look at gender in through the lens of ICT, there were lots of women uh, who got advantage from this uh, digital platform where they they probably progress in terms of their entrepreneurial skills and hubs. Uh, there's also another thing that pandemic uh, kind of made us realize the pandemic can actually hit the poor and vulnerable population. So the essential lesson we learned during this is there is a need to reduce inequalities uh, and there is also need of in including the promotion of gender equality. So I think this is where gender comes uh, being inexcutably linked with with lots of other goals um, than a single and standing out alone. Right, okay. And let's just look at that in a little more detail, taking the example of malnutrition. The idea, the conclusion from your paper that because of the pandemic, there was a greater realization of the importance of malnutrition, um, obviously for health and particularly for vulnerable groups, but then also, as you were saying, how it is linked to other sectors like agriculture. But having recognized that, now the important thing is to follow that through to see that someone is actually working on helping to end malnutrition. And 
Obviously, there are sectors in society, the health ministry and NGOs and INGOs and the agriculture ministry, etc., who are working on ending malnutrition now. But who is it who will say, I mean, what authority will say, okay, these six things we have identified, we need to work harder on these. Um, we're going to come up with a plan to ensure that whoever is already responsible for malnutrition does it even better so that we reach the SDG. Who would do that? And is that, I mean, is that a useful way to look at it? Or am I somehow being too, too demanding of, of the system? Yeah, I would say quite demanding because I already said that um, uh, while, while we see how Nepal operationalized, it's not uh, one single force, right? It has a lot of tires, uh, lots of tires of government and lots of other social and economic factors. So I think just because of the lesson learned about the um, nutrition, there has to be something or someone who would say, okay, we learned the lesson during the pandemic and now after X, Y, Z time or five to 10 years no women's or you know like no children or no elderly people are suffering from malnutrition i think that we should not expect in in it in that way but i would definitely say that we should have a sound plan what what we call is a socio economic recovery plan and i think that's the window that would provide an opportunity to steer a more holistic socio economic system to our sustainable transformation and instead of like going back and rebounding to the past trajectory, maybe if we follow the sound plan and deal with the uh, pandemic's uh, negative impact, then that's how we would uh, safe land in, in coming year. It's not um, just one person or one entity which would ensure uh, about the situation of malnourishment, but it is the resultant of all other factors to ensure the malnourishment, thereby also looking at other factors like health, like sanitation, like clean energy, education, like lots of other factors comes together. But we will, of course, progress in terms of malnourishment as well. Thank you. Is there anything else? Other thing is, uh, this pandemic has highlighted a need for more pro-poor, gender-sensitive, uh, equitable, and inclusive policy framework on the social security programs, which, which would further ensure the realization of SDG 1, 5, and 10, which more talks about um, no poverty or gender equality. So I think this kind of policy framework should already be uh, operationalized on time in order to be prepared uh, when the other shot of crisis would um, hit us again. Okay, great. Another very concrete suggestion, which I like very much. Sijal, thank you very much for spending some time with me today to talk about the report and the challenges and opportunities of COVID-19. And I hope that other people, people in power are are listening and reading so that some of these changes actually do start to happen in the coming years before the window of opportunity closes. Yeah, thank you very much, Marty. It was indeed a pleasure being here and thank you for having me.